Hello, here's what's coming up on The World Today. Co-joined twins in Kano, Nigeria, head to Saudi Arabia for life-saving separation surgery. The world begins right now. Away from the Israeli Hamas war, Pakistani authorities today swung into action a day after the government's deadline expired for undocumented refugees to leave or face expulsion. An Afghan colony on the outskirts of the capital, Islamabad, was razed to the ground by bulldozers as hundreds of residents of the colony watched in despair. Pakistani authorities began rounding up undocumented refugees, most of them Afghans, hours before Wednesday's deadline. More than a million Afghans could have to leave or face arrest and forcible expulsion as a result of the ultimatum delivered by the Pakistan government a month ago. Scrambling to cope with the sudden influx, the Taliban-run administration in Afghanistan said temporary transit camps had been set up and food and medical assistance would be provided, but relief agencies reported dire conditions across the border. And Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, says the European Union needs a strong policy on cooperation of defense industries. He was making the comments as the, at the start of the EU summit on EU enlargement and reforms in Berlin. Mr. Kuleba told a press conference a specific policy on cooperation of defense industries should become one of the pillars of common security and defense policy in the EU. I will raise with my fellow colleagues the point that among many policies that the European Union is implementing, we need a new, strong, consolidated policy, EU policy on cooperation of defense industries of uh, EU countries and candidate countries, because we see that in order to defend itself, in order to resolve conflicts and deter aggressions in Europe, uh, efforts in the area of defense industry need to be stepped up. And this specific policy of cooperation of defense industry should become one of the pillars of the common security and defense policy of the European Union. I think that the reaction of the European Union and the way the European Union handled the Russian aggression against Ukraine since last February taught the Union a lot and the European Union showed that it can do much more. So we have to move from maintain status quo and react to shape status quo and be proactive. And this is the added value that Ukraine can bring to the future of the European Union. We in Poland strongly believe that the accession process does not require any change of treatises, any institutional reform of the European Union, because the legal framework that is being offering right now by the treatises is absolutely feed for the enlargement process. So, moreover, we are strongly convinced that the principle of unanimity guarantees uh, strong support of each and every country for the EU initiatives. Russia believes Western sanctions over Ukraine do nothing to impact Russia, but affects the people who impose them. Government spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said at a press conference that Russia expects more sanctions to be introduced in the future. He told reporters, naturally, our expectations are that the US and EU will continue to imagine new sanctions, although it's obvious they have a lack of ideas already. By the way, both the US and EU have an understanding that current packages of sanctions hurt the interests of countries which impose these sanctions. That's why they have a definite problem with developing of new sanctions package. But we don't hesitate and don't wear rose-tinted glasses. The pressure of sanctions will continue and there will be attempts to increase it. In return, our economy has adapted to these conditions quite well. Moreover, we are trying to get benefits for ourselves in some ways, we succeed. End of quote. 
Turkey says it has captured Hakan Ayik, a top fugitive wanted in Australia for drug smuggling and 36 others involved in an international organized crime ring that has also been pursued by U.S. and New Zealand authorities. Dubbed the Facebook gangster in Australia, Ayik has been on the most wanted list in New South Wales state for more than a decade for the supply of large commercial quantities of drugs. The FBI has said he unwittingly helped authorities monitor and arrest hundreds of suspected criminals in recent years while unwittingly using an FBI-run phone app. The command chair of a motorcycle gang targeted in the operation was involved in drug trafficking, manslaughter, looting, money laundering globally. Interior Minister Ali Yarakalia has also allegedly said the laundering is assets in Turkey. He added that the drug trade spanned South America, Australia, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, South Korea and South Africa. And now, the Australian woman suspected of poisoning her former in-laws and others with deadly mushrooms at a lunch site, uh, a lunch rather, that she served has been charged with multiple counts of murder and attempted murder. Three people died after Erin Patterson, 49, served beef wellington, a dish that includes mushrooms, to guests in July. Police say while three murder charges relate to the launch, three of five attempted murder charges are linked to separate incidents between 2021 and 2022. Ms. Patterson maintains she is innocent. She has said she did not intentionally poison her guests at the family launch at her home in Victoria Town on the 29th of July. Toxicology reports suggest the victims consumed death cap mushrooms. Her former husband, Simon Patterson, had also been invited to the meal but was unable to make it at the last minute. And it's day two of the AI Safety Summit in London as political and tech leaders arrive at the uh, Milton Keynes, uh, north of London, uh, earlier today. The meeting is the brainchild of Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who wants to carve out a role for Britain as an intermediary between the economic blocs of the US, China and the EU. The 100-strong guest list includes world leaders, US Vice President Kamala Harris, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, at least Prime Minister, uh, Georgia Meloni, tech executives like Elon Musk, Chat GPT boss Sam Altman, and academics for the event at the Bletchley Park, home of Britain's World War II code breakers. Skeptics have questioned how much influence Britain can wield when the US, the group of seven industrialized nations, and the EU are pushing other initiatives, some of which are advanced. Well, at the summit today, Vice President, uh, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris called for urgent action uh, to protect the public from threats posed by AI. She said the world faced dangers uh, from artificial intelligence, such as cyber attacks or bioweapons. China is a key participant at the U.K. summit, uh, given the country's role in developing AI, but some British lawmakers have questioned whether it should be there given the low level of trust between Beijing, Washington and many European capitals when it comes to China's involvement in technology. The US made it clear on the eve of the summit that the call to include China had very much come from Britain and Harris's decision to give a speech in London on Wednesday about her government's response to AI and hold some meetings with attendees away from the summit, meaning that they may have to leave early also. Uh, that raised some eyebrows. And a new study supports the weird idea that we are all living in a computer simulation, a theory that could have implications for science and technology. That's according to a physicist at the University of Portsmouth. The work by Dr. Melvin Vopson, an associate professor of physics and published in uh, 
advances suggest the universe behaves just like a computer in ordering, deleting unnecessary information, a sign he says that reality could be a construct. The simulated universe hypothesis has some high-profile supporters, including Elon Musk and within a branch of science known as information physics, which suggests everything is fundamentally made up of bits of information. Dr. Vopson's second law of infodynamics or information dynamics essentially minimizes the information content associated with any system, event or process in the universe. I don't want to paraphrase Morpheus from, <laughs> from, from Matrix, but he said what is real uh, in the movie at the very beginning, you know, before taking the red pill. What is real, you know, is just electrical signals that are being fed to our brain through our perception, and we decode them and we construct the reality around us, images, sound, perception of touching things and, um, um, you know, um, the, the, the smell, the, all the senses that we have, they are just electrical signals that are being um, decoded by our brains, which are, what is this? Is a biological computer, there's nothing more. I found the second law of information dynamics is not only that seems to permeate everything in the universe, including mathematical entities, but the universe appears to minimize the, to optimize the optimal. It requires the, the most optimal compression of information to be minimal. So this is absolutely remarkable. So if this is a law that refers to computational processes and information itself, is compressed in a way that exactly what computers do and computer programs and how we transfer information from point to point, the minimum required amount of information transferred from point to point minimum required in order to decode the, sig the, the, the signal, okay, or the message. And then you, it begs the question, so what is the role of this information? What is this, all this missing stuff? 95% we can't find, we can't see. Well, that's the code. Maybe that is the code that runs the simulation. And we are in it, and we can't, we experience it in a very bizarre way, very, by, by limited means. One is the gravitational interaction and the, we, we just see the accelerated expansion of the universe and other things. Uh, but this is, I admit, this is a bit more speculative because it needs some experimental testing. Well, back here in Africa, King Charles and Queen Camilla today from a Mombasa Habo dock and Kenyan Marine stage, a mock covert landing using techniques learned from the UK's Royal Marines. The royal couple are on the third of a four-day visit to the East African country, where the king has said he would attempt to understand the impact of colonial-era atrocities at the hands of the British on the country. Warfare has been a recurring theme throughout the trip. Charles and Camilla visited a cemetery for veterans of World War II the previous day, November 1st, where Charles King Charles used the occasion to address the historical inequalities, which meant that Kenyans who fought alongside the British during both world wars were not commemorated. They awarded medals to four veterans who had fought alongside the British, replacing ones they had deposed of during the Mau Mau uprising in the 1950s when some 90,000 Kenyans were killed or injured and 160,000 detained. The Saudi embassy has airlifted Hassana and Husseina Issa, co-joined twins of Kano Indigen to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for surgical separation. The consulate general in company with Kano state governor Abu Yusuf were at the airport to see them off. Our correspondent Sadiq Liasu reports. This would be the first time effort has been made regarding the separation of 24-month-old Hassana and Husseina twins conjoined in the chest from birth. Thanks to the Saudi government, the delicate but necessary surgery will be done in Riyadh, where the government will take care of their transportation, medical bills, accommodation, and well-being until their return. Carried by their mother, the twins arrive at the Aminikano International Airport to board a private jet to Riyadh. This is not the first time we are doing this kind of operation for Nigerian babies. Just recently, we carried out free heart surgeries here in Kano. 
We are hoping this surgery will also be successful like the previous one. And as you can see, we intend to take care of all their needs until they return back to Nigeria. Speaking to journalists at the airport terminal, the Kano State Governor Abba Yusuf commends the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for its unwavering support to Nigerians. We appreciated this gesture and we felt on top of the world seeing uh, the king in his usual humanitarian gesture, uh, sympathy for the people, not only Nigeria, but the entire community. Kano uh, State Governor will never, never forget. Uh, this philanthropist uh, uh, assistant, and uh, on behalf of the people of Kano State, as well as the government and parents, uh, we wish to extend an appreciation to him, as well as to the entire good people of Saudi Arabia. Hassana and Hussein Isa already share vital organs. Their parents and the Kano State government have high hopes they will return as two separate beings and hail and hearty. Sadiq Ilyasu, Channel Television News. Well, in Nigeria, the Kano state government has played host to the flag off of the European Union study in Europe fair in the country. The study fair is to give Nigerian students education opportunities to study in Europe through cooperation and become agents of growth to their country. Kano state government also applauded the study in Europe fair flag off as they express the readiness of the state to partner with the EU in addressing most of its educational challenges, noting that they have no fewer than one million out-of-school children. Channel's correspondent, Nanchin Vincent, the has more. ...by the European Union held in Kano State. The European Union has awarded scholarships to 800 Nigerians in nine years and is hoping that the flag off will strengthen the collaboration between Europe and Nigerians to take opportunity of the study fair. Speaking of the flag off, EU ambassador to Nigeria and ECOWAS noted that the collaboration will help students connect with better education opportunities. This event is about connecting people through education opportunities for young Nigerians to study in Europe, but also through cooperation opportunities between universities and higher education institutions of Europe and Nigeria. 23 European partners 18, among which 18 European higher education institutions and five national education services are with us today in Kano to present their offer to Nigerian students and to engage with education institutions in Kano and Northern Nigeria. She further stressed that it was not for them to relocate out of the country, otherwise known as JAPA, but to be beneficial to the development of their country. This initiative today is not an encouragement to Java, but an opportunity to develop and use the skills you will develop in Europe to the benefit of your society and the benefit of your country. Kano State Governor Representative, the Deputy Governor, expressed readiness to partner with the EU in addressing the challenges of education in the state, as Kano has over one million out-of-school children. Kano has over one million out-of-school children which are of both gender, male and female. We are doing all, we are doing everything humanly possible to get the children off the streets and back to school. Kano State government will, however, welcome the European Union special interest and intervention in Kano State in this regard. The Erasmus program has been offering students scholarships since 2014, as the European Union emphasized on its commitment to support Nigeria in terms of human capital development. And the largest internally flawless fancy vivid blue diamond ever put up for auction could sell for up to $50 million at a Christie sale of rare jewels in Geneva on November the 7th. Known as Blue Royale, this vivid blue diamond, which is set in a ring, is among the rarest ever to be on Earth. International Head of Jewelry for Christie's, Rahul Deca, um, Kadakia, confirms the Blue Royale is among the rarest ever 
to be seen. The auctioneer will also be presenting a Rolex wristwatch worn by Marlon Brando in the 1979 movie A Couple Lips Now, on the back of which the actor engraved his signature to avoid having it swapped accidentally during shooting. What makes Bleu Royale so rare and special is its size. At 17.6 carats, it's the largest of its kind. It's a pear-shaped, brilliant cut diamond. What that means is it's a classical cut. It has not been modified with additional facets to help enhance the color. And so the color is very rich naturally, and it is internally flawless as best as can be. We, we, we hope, we hope it will beat the Oppenheimer. Uh, we hope it will make a very strong prize. We have toured it all around the world, to Asia, to the US and Europe, and we've had good interest from collectors worldwide, and uh, we'll see what happens on November 7th. What's special about the necklace is that she wore it in the last scene of Roman Holiday, which was such a great movie, which, which audiences have enjoyed so much, and where she played a young royal enjoying herself in Rome. This is a watch that was once owned by Marlon Brando. Uh, what makes it truly unique is that it is really one of the most recognizable uh, memorabilia Rolex that has ever surfaced at auction. It's a wristwatch that used to belong to a mega actor that used to be worn by Marlon Brando in Apocalypse Now, uh, which was shot in 1979, um, and that also has an incredible personality. It's not like every uh, reference 1675 that you'll find. It's was actually personalized in a certain way by the owner uh, and the actor. Well, let's head to China now, where the decade-long war on air pollution has provided a world battling global warming with an answer to an invaluable experiment. What happens to the climate when a major coolant like sulfur dioxide is removed from the atmosphere? Well, that's a major component of smog. It creates cloud-forming particles in the lower atmosphere that absorb, scatter and reflect back sunlight, potentially reducing the warming effect of greenhouse gas. And this is what scientists have contended. Well, climate experts have been looking closely at whether the successful efforts to cut marine fuel emissions since 2020 were responsible for driving sea temperatures to record levels this year. But the dramatic cuts in sulfur dioxide from China's vehicles and smokestacks over the last decade could also have had a major warming impact, particularly in Asia. We are actually heating the planet by improving the air quality. So that's the uh, trade-offs and the sort of unexpected consequences of the air quality fight. Sulfur pollution works like particles in the atmosphere. Uh, they reflect sunlight, just like typical sunscreen. And uh, by reducing solar radiation reaching the surface, it cools the planet. So the air quality improvement by getting rid of uh, coal-fired power plants and uh, adding scrubbers on top of all those uh, emitting uh, facilities actually make climate change, the global warming issue, worse. So the reduction of uh, sulfur allows more radiation to get to the surface, which makes the surface warmer. So increase of sulfate emissions tends to cool the system, reduction of sulfate tends to warm the system. When sunlight falling on the surface is changed, so let's say it's uh, increased, um, there tends to be uh, more evaporation from the surface. More evaporation means more precipitation because there has to be a balance between whatever, evapor whatever water is evaporated, all that water has to come down. So therefore, a reduction of sulfur means more sunlight to the surface, more evaporation, which tends to enhance uh, precipitation. Well, we end the program with what can only be described as a perfect rescue. Emergency services and a police car had to break into a car near Kremlin following reports of a cat being locked inside. The cat, according to local news outlets, had spent days in the car without food or water. 
Attention was brought to its flight by one passerby who noticed the animal on Wednesday. It was not immediately clear who the cat belonged to, but the owner of the car was reported to have been taken to a psychiatric facility several days uh, before prior uh, the cat was rescued. After being spotted, the cat in trouble quickly drew attention of people around who suggested smashing a window uh, of a car to set the feline free. The emergency <laughs> services, however, managed to open the door without damaging the car. Local media said the cat was dehydrated and hungry, but otherwise in good shape. An officer working for Moscow's prosecutor's office was reported to have temporarily adopted the cat while it recuperates. <laughs> Well, we are glad the cat's okay. That's our program this evening. Thank you for watching. I'm the Central Forecast. Bye for now.